The next item of business is a statement by Shirley Ann Somerville on update on Scottish Government review of the 2004 Gender Recognition Act. And the Cabinet Secretary will take questions at the end of her statement, so there should be no interventions and no interruptions. And I call on Shirley Ann Somerville. 15 minutes, please, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In my statement today, I want to set out the background to the Gender Recognition Act 2004 and the case for its reform. I will also consider the relationship between gender recognition legislation and the Equality Act 2010 and outline the steps the government intends to take next, both to deliver dignity for trans men and women and to continue to address concerns raised about, for example, access to women's only spaces. First, the background to the 2004 Act and the case for reform. In 2002, the European Court of Human Rights found the UK to have breached the European Convention on Human Rights in respect of the lack of legal recognition afforded to trans people. The Parliament therefore enacted the 2004 Act, which this Parliament agreed through a sole motion. As a result, trans men and women were, for the first time, given the right to seek legal recognition of their lived gender and if they were born in the UK, to access an updated birth certificate and to do so without undergoing gender reassignment surgery or medical treatment. The 2004 Act was, at the time, groundbreaking. However, over time, there have been growing recognition that the process enshrined in that Act, which requires applications to be considered by a gender recognition panel, to be overly complex and medicalised. For those using it, the process can be deeply traumatic and stressful. In recommending reform of the Act in January 2016, the House of Commons Women and Equalities Committee stated that the current process, and I quote, runs contrary to the dignity and personal autonomy of applicants. Given this, my party had a commitment in our 2016 manifesto to review and reform gender recognition law and bring into line with international best practice. Every other political party represented in this parliament made a similar manifesto commitment. The UK government has also recognised the complexities of the system and in 2018 consulted on reforming the law in England and Wales. There are two points worth stressing here. First, gender recognition has been in place since 2005. It is not new. The issue we are debating is the reform of that process by which the right to gender recognition is exercised, a matter I will return to shortly. Second, in reforming gender recognition, Law Scotland will not in any sense be leading the way or taking action which is unprecedented. On the contrary, the Republic of Ireland, Denmark, Belgium and Norway are amongst the countries that have already adopted new gender recognition processes similar to those we have consulted on. Let me now turn to the relationship between gender recognition law and the Equality Act 2010. The Equality Act 2010, which is reserved legislation, provides protections from discrimination, victimisation and harassment on the basis of protected characteristics, including sex and gender reassignment. Across all parts of society, these rights are hard won and must be protected. One particular area of concern that has been raised about gender recognition reform, both during and since the consultation, is the impact it will have on the provision and protection of single sex or women only spaces and services. Presiding officer, it is vital to be clear on this important point. The Equality Act already allows trans people to be excluded in some circumstances from single sex services where that is proportionate and justifiable, including where a trans person has legal recognition. The government's proposals to reform the Gender Recognition Act will not affect that position. This government wants to protect and promote the rights of women, and we want to protect and promote the rights of trans people too. I am a feminist, and I am deeply and rightly proud that this government has taken such clear and concerted action to protect women's rights and to promote gender equality. I have stated before, as, the, as has the First Minister, that I don't feel a conflict between my support for women's rights and for trans rights. But I know and I understand that many do. It is important that we listen to and, importantly, address those concerns. Of course, at their core, these concerns are not about trans women. Rather, they are about men who seek to abuse women. The fear is that some men will misuse trans equality to access women and to do us harm. And I understand that. I understand that predatory men will always seek to find ways to harm women. That's not a new problem in Scottish or global society. 
nor is it a problem created by or the fault of the trans community. This government has a duty to address the concern that reforming the process for gender recognition will increase the risks that women face from men. And this is something I have sought to do already and will continue to do as we seek to build confidence that achieving equality and dignity for trans men and women is possible without diminishing the rights of anyone else. In my view, an important aspect of this is to be clear about what the proposed reform of the Gender Recognition Act actually entails and just as importantly, what it does not entail. So let me move now to our proposed next steps. As members are aware, in 2018, the Scottish Government held a 16-week public consultation. It sought views on the proposal that for applicants for gender recognition, the existing requirements to provide medical information and evidence that they have lived in their acquired gender for at least two years be removed. Over 15,500 responses were received. 49% of responses came from Scotland. 60% of all responses and 65% of those from, of, from Scotland were in favour of reform. However, some groups raised concerns and since the closure of the consultation, additional issues. Many not in fact directly related to the Bill's proposals have also been raised. I have taken time to listen and to understand those concerns. And I have also heard accounts of the anxiety and trauma the current process causes trans people and the difference that reform of the law would make to their ability to live their lives with dignity and acceptance. And I will now set out our proposed way forward. Let me be very clear. The Scottish Government remains committed to reforming the 2004 Act and ensuring the process for trans people to access a gender recognition certificate is in line with international best practice. And more importantly, that it does not result in any unnecessary stress. However, I am acutely aware of how divided opinion is on this issue and I want to proceed in a way that builds maximum consensus and allows valid concerns to be properly addressed. For that reason, we will not introduce legislation to Parliament immediately. Instead, it is my intention to publish a draft Gender Recognition Scotland Bill later this year. The Bill will be formally introduced to Parliament only when there has been full consultation on the precise details contained within that draft bill. This consultation will include draft impact assessments, including a comprehensive updated equality impact assessment to ensure that all rights are protected in a balanced way. This additional step in the process will, I hope, give Parliament and all stakeholders the opportunity to consider and respond to specific proposals and it will allow discussions to move from the general to the detailed. All aspects of the draft bill will be open for consultation. We will take forward the legislation when that process has taken place and we are content that responses have been analysed, concerns allayed and that we can introduce a bill that has the support of this Parliament and of the public. We will inform Parliament of the timetable for legislation once this process has been completed. Let me now outline some of the key provisions which will be in that draft bill for consultation. Existing requirements in the 2004 Act to provide medical evidence will be removed. However, it is important to stress that the current requirements will be replaced by an alternative statutory process. The term self-identification is routinely used, but in my view, this does not adequately reflect the seriousness or the permanency of the process envisaged. As now, applicants will be required to make a solemn statutory declaration that they intend to live in their acquired gender permanently. In addition, applicants will be required to state in the statutory declaration that they have already been living in their acquired gender. Currently, applicants for a gender recognition certificate are required to have been living in their acquired gender for a minimum of two years. It is the opinion of the Scottish Government that this should be reduced. Our initial proposal will be for three months, but again, this will be fully consulted on. The draft bill will propose that after an application for gender recognition has been made and has been checked to ensure the necessary information and statutory declaration have been provided, there will be a mandatory three-month reflection period before a gender recognition certificate be can be granted. At the end of this period, an applicant will need to confirm that they still wish to proceed. So applicants will need to have lived in their acquired gender for at least six months before a gender recognition certificate can be granted. It is and will remain a criminal offence to make a false statutory declaration, the potential punishment for which includes up to two years imprisonment. 
retaining the requirement for a statutory declaration, being clear of false declaration as a criminal offence, and building in time for reflection enshrines in law the seriousness of this process. No one should doubt that this is a significant undertaking and requires the same le level of commitment from the individual as the existing system does. Presiding officer, the draft bill will not propose legal gender recognition for those under 16, though we will consider further whether the minimum age of applicants should be reduced from 18 to 16. The consultation will also seek views on what support is needed generally for children and young people uncertain of their gender identity. Central to this is ensuring that all young people have access to support from a trusted adult who they know will listen sympathetically and without judgment, whether that be from a third sector organisation or mental health and wellbeing service. I have heard directly from young trans people of the fear that they face, and our mental health and wellbeing strategy sets out that we must have a country where people can get the right help at the right time, free from discrimination and stigma. This must be true for those querying their gender identity, just as it should be for all young people. I do not intend at this time to extend legal gender recognition to non-binary people, but we recognise the need to address the issues that non-binary people face. I intend to establish a working group to consider possible changes to procedures and practice and what we can learn from best practice internationally, as well as from within Scotland and the rest of the UK. As I said earlier, it's clear that not all of the concerns raised over the past years relate to the specifics of the proposals to reform the Gender Recognition Act. Instead, they are about wider societal and policy issues connected to sex and gender. We recognise that unless we build a strong foundation of clear policy and guidance, then many concerns, particularly from some women, will not be allayed, while at the same time trans rights may not be upheld. Equally, it is important we ensure policies we put in place protect the rights of different groups of people and avoid what may appear to be some rights taking precedence over others. Everyone in Scotland deserves to know that this government will work to promote their rights and protect them from discrimination. It is not enough for me to just say that is our aim. We must demonstrate that commitment in a way that everyone can have trust in. This government will therefore develop guidance that helps bring clarity to these issues and ensures that policymakers and service providers better understand how to ensure that the hard-won rights of both women and trans people can be collectively realised. This will be used across the Scottish Government and available to all public authorities to help inform policy development and implementation. It will also, of course, be publicly available. I can confirm that the type of approach to policy development is being used by the Scottish Government on guidance for schools. We recognise that this is a complicated area and the recent guidance for schools from LGBT Youth Scotland on transgender young people was produced in good faith and with wide consultation and engagement with a clear intention of supporting teachers to ensure that all transgender and non-binary children and young people are safe, supported and included in their schools. However, the complexity of these issues mean valid concerns have been raised. The Scottish Government recognises that in taking the inarguably good general principle of inclusivity and developing specific recommendations, the approach risks potentially excluding other girls from female-only spaces, and that cannot be right. We have therefore decided to replace the LGBT youth work with guidance from the Scottish Government. This work is already underway and will be available by the end of the year and be subject to an equality impact assessment. In addition, I want to take this opportunity to begin to address an issue that was raised by some women's groups during the consultation, the collection, disaggregation and use of data by sex and gender. The issue does not result specifically from gender recognition, but there is some overlap. And it has also received increased prominence following the publication of the book Invisible Women by Caroline Creado Perez. This book has drawn attention to the frequency with which data is neither collected nor aggregated in a way that takes account of the differences, including biological and physical differences, between men and women and the impact of this in areas such as transport, health and access to services. I can therefore announce that the Scottish Government will establish a working group on sex and gender and data compri compri comprised of professionals from across statistical services. This will be led by and report to the Chief Statistician. The working group will consider what guidance should be offered to public bodies on the collection of data on sex and gender, 
including what form data collection and disaggregation is most appropriate in different circumstances. In conclusion, presiding officer, the debate in relation to gender recognition has raised a wide number of issues. The aim of this government is to ensure that trans people in Scotland enjoy equality and feel safe and accepted for who they are. And we want to achieve this, and we believe we can do so in a way that does not infringe upon the rights of anyone else. These issues need to be considered carefully, openly, thoughtfully and respectfully. A process of deliberation that is taken forward in such a way will, in my view, enable us to bring forward balanced and evidence proposals and legislation which can be agreed on by this Parliament and supported by the public. I will continue to engage and listen to stakeholders and I will maintain my open door policy to all MSPs. I will carry out my role to protect all rights and promote equality for all respectfully. I hope that in the coming months everyone in this chamber will do the same and that just as this parliament has found consensus in the past we will be able to do so again and I'm happy to take questions. The Cabinet Secretary will now take questions on the issues raised in her statement and I will allow up to 30 minutes for that. It would be helpful if members who wish to ask a question would press their, their request to speak buttons now, please. And I call on Annie Wells. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and thank you to the Cabinet Secretary for early sight of her statement. I'm very pleased to see that we've seen an update from the Scottish Government on this. And I'm sure I speak for all members when I say this topic has raised strong feelings from all sides and there has been very high volume of correspondence. What I wish to put on record today and what I have been saying to all constituents and interest groups who have contacted me about this is my sincere belief that we need to keep this debate respectful and open. We need to listen to one another so that we can get this right. I welcome the announcement of another consultation very often I think we forget as politicians that not everyone is aware that such consultations take place and given the concerns that have been raised it is sensible that we allowed a wider debate to take place and I also welcome that an equality impact assessment will be carried out. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary for more detail on the alternative statutory process as this will be the main focus of the bill? Can I also ask if there will be any leeway on the six month time frame cited and whether there will be flexibility in increasing or decreasing it. And can I also just rough, ask just roughly when the Scottish Government expects the consultation process to be over and responses published? Shirley Ann Somerville. Uh, well, can I begin by thanking Annie Wells for that question and the, the tone in, 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 in which we're, we're having this conversation. And I do see as we move forward that this will be a conversation that I will hopefully have with members from across the chamber um, as, as we move forward for this. She is absolutely right to say that this debate has strong feelings from uh, many people, but we need to have that respectful and, and open debate and listen to each other uh, together. And I'm sure if we do that, we can move forward. The consultation is very important because it will allow that wider debate about the detail of what we're going on. There's been a lot of speculation about what I'm saying today or not saying, and we can now discuss that um, in detail, which I'm certainly very pleased about. The statutory process is, as I laid out in my uh, statement, uh, an issue that is absolutely available and open for that consultation. Uh, we will put forward our proposal, such as the six month uh, time frame in terms of uh, how long a person uh, should have been living in an acquired gender uh, before application and indeed that, that period of reflection. Uh, but I am very thoughtful of uh, the lessons that we can learn from international examples um, and indeed what uh, we can do to ensure that we are providing reassurance for those that need that reassurance about how that process for work and I look forward uh, to, to working with Annie Wells and, and others on this issue as we move forward. Pauline McNeill. I would like to thank the Cabinet Secretary for advance sight of today's statement which is comprehensive and I welcome the fact that we have one. I also welcome the opportunity to question the Cabinet Secretary as a member who scrutinised and supported the 2004 Act on Gender Recognition. Scottish Labour has always been at the vanguard of promoting equality, dignity and respect. And we strongly believe that people should be able to live their lives free from prejudice. 
and I know from my own casework that trans people face prejudice and discrimination every day. It is these principles that will undermine our approach to scrutinise proposed legislation when it comes forward. We are clear that specialist services for trans people can be improved now without legislation or reduction in the fee for our gender recognition certificate and the processes could be simpler without legislation. I have three questions for the Cabinet Secretary. In the move to a statutory declaration for gender recognition legislation, is there any thought being given to how a false declaration would be established? Secondly, um, the statement says in the re reference to the Equality Act 2010, it is our view that this applies where a trans person has legal recognition. The government's proposals to reform the Equality Act will not affect that position. I just wanted to get an answer in relation to that. On page six, it also says that the consultation will include a draft impact assessment, including a comprehensive updated equality impact assessment. I was just wanted to be clear that we can't draw any conclusions from an equality impact assessment before it's done. And finally, uh, the working group, which I do welcome on sex and gender data, will there be representation of trans people and non-binary people to ensure that scrutiny all the way down is inclusive? Shirley Ann Somerville. Uh, can I, I thank Pauline McNeil for, for those questions and, and absolutely recognise uh, the history that Scottish Labour does have on equality issues um, in, in general, including on this issue. And it's also an issue I think that this Parliament can be exceptionally proud of the work that we have done. And I hope with that history uh, that we can find a way forward and move in consensus on this. The aspects of false declarations is, of course, an exceptionally important one. It, it, it really is the, the basis on which I hope people can have faith and, and trust in the system that, that we have. Uh, on this and, and on others, I, I don't come to the chamber with all the answers today. I'm laying forward the, the government's proposals and very much um, this is a, an open consultation where the direction of travel and the, the destination of, in, of changing the gender recognition um, reform is, is, is set, but how we do that and the details of how we do that, including around false declarations, uh, I think is very important that we set out. We've tried to do that. I've tried to do that in the work that we've done about ensuring a period of reflection, of ensuring that it's a statutory declaration that someone's meeting in front of a notary public, and in terms of the, the very, very uh, uh, strong um, prison sentence that's there um, if, if um, there is a, a false declaration. But if there are other areas, again, which we can look at, I'm more than happy to do so. The, my, con my comments on the uh, Equality Act and on women's safe spaces are based on what's in the Equality Act, which is reserved and which we will not be asking the UK government to change. And indeed, which from my discussions with the UK government, they have no intention of changing either. So the aspects around uh, I hope the reassurance I tried to provide in my statement around women's safe spaces it will not be changed by uh, this, these proposals for, for change. Uh, but it is important that we carry out an equality impact assessment to look at the differences that the reforms we are proposing will change. But it won't be around um, the, the exemptions for, for single-sex um, services. We have not... Um, decided on the makeup of working groups and, and so on. But I, I do absolutely take the point that it's important that I listen to, uh, to the trans community, to, to people who identify as non-binary, to women's groups and so on. How we do that, again, I'm more than happy if Pauline McNeil has specific suggestions on that for us to uh, discuss that later, um, either in person or in correspondence. Uh, moving now to open questions. Um, the front bench questions have taken a long time and I, I know it's a subject that many, many people want to ask questions on. So if we could bear that in mind as we move forward. I have Angela Constance followed by Patrick Harvey. Thank you, presiding officer. The cabinet secretary in her balanced and thoughtful statement uh, reminded us all that all parties represented in this chamber made manifesto commitments to reform the Gender Recognition Act. So given that you can't have equality for one group and not another, I would be grateful if the Cabinet Secretary could say more about how we will protect and enhance the rights of both transgender people and women without diminishing the rights of either. Shirley-Anne Somerville. 
Thank you, Angela Connors, for that, that question. The government has an, an absolute determination to ensure that we have equality um, for all groups in our community, and that concludes the trans community who do suffer uh, uh, discrimination and who, who can be exceptionally isolated. Um, and that's why it's important that we do take action on this. But we need to consider how we support all groups in our uh, society. That's why, well, as we're moving forward with the proposed uh, changes to gender recognition, we absolutely have to recognise, and I have to recognise, the concerns that have been expressed about the proposals for reform. I think we very, can, uh, we very much can move forward to uh, alleviate those concerns if we put the work in on a cross-party basis to be able to, to deliver that consensus. And I think it is very, very important that we respect the views of those who have concerns about this uh, because I do believe fundamentally that it, it is possible for the Parliament to be able to pass legislation that respects the rights of both the trans community and uh, women that have been long fought for. Patrick Harvey, followed by Jenny Gilruth. Thank you, and I'm grateful for the advanced copy of the statement. I welcome the fact that it does contain a commitment to the principle of Gender Recognition Act reform, including the move to a self-declaration system that's already in place without problem in a number of other countries. And I also welcome the balance with which the, the Cabinet Secretary discussed the other concerns and questions that have been raised. The, the statement recognised that many such concerns are not about trans people, but about abuse of men and the threat that they pose. All women, including trans women and other trans people, are at particular risk from that kind of behaviour. So it's something we should all want to see taken seriously. But trans people have been waiting a long time for this reform, and they have support from across the political spectrum and from well-respected women's and feminist organisations across Scotland as well. So does the Cabinet Secretary agree that they deserve to know that a parliament in which every single member stood for election on a manifesto promise to deliver this reform will indeed pass the legislation. Can the cabinet secretary confirm that it is the government's intention that Could the legislation will be introduced please, in Mr. good Harvey. time to be completed before the end of this parliament? Uh, before I call Shirley Ann Somerville, can I just say there's lots of people wish to ask questions here. If everyone insists on making statements before they ask the question, we're not going to get through half of those that I have requests for. Shirley Ann Somerville. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, I fully appreciate that, that some people uh, will be frustrated by my proposals today, that they feel that the pace of reform has not gone uh, fast enough um, for them. I want to see reform of the gender recognition process. I want to introduce a bill about gender recognition, but more importantly, I want to see a bill about gender recognition passed by this parliament and passed with wide support, not just in this chamber, but in the wider public. And in my judgment, the proposals that I set out today are the best way to achieve that. Uh, others may disagree, and I absolutely expect, uh, respect that entirely but I do want to get to the same destination. And I would ask those that are feeling perhaps frustrated eh, to work with me to that point. Eh, we will move forward with a, a, a bill once this consultation has gone forward, as I've said out in my statement, once those consultation responses have, have been analyzed. And then of course, we will report back to parliament on the timetable for that bill in due course. Jenny Goldruth, followed by Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Equality Act and the Gender Recognition Act have been in place for longer than a decade. And given that there is a clear exemption for transgender people accessing single-sex spaces and single-sex services under the Equality Act when it is proportionate and reasonable to do so, can the Cabinet Secretary explain if the changes being outlined today seek in any way to change that? Shirley-Anne Somerville. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, if you will allow me, I, I will repeat what I've said on this earlier because I think it is an exceptionally important point and one which has quite rightly raised a great number, uh, deal of concern. The Equality Act, I can confirm again, the 2010 Equality Act enables service providers to offer separate and differing services to males and females or to one sex only subject to certain criteria. And these services can treat people with protected characteristics of gender reassignment differently or exclude them completely where the action taken is proportionate means of achieving 
a legitimate aim. I spoke in my statement about the ability of a women's refuge to refuse en uh, entry. Um, and I would say, once again, we are not planning to ask the UK Government for any changes to the exemptions in this area in the 2010 Act. Alex Cole-Hamilton, followed by John McAlpin. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. We asked for reform of the GRA in the last Parliament because it was harming trans people then, just as it is harming them now. I understand what the Cabinet Secretary is trying to achieve here, but I am concerned there is now a risk that we might not pass legislation before this Parliament rises. For every month, this debate does not take place in this chamber. It takes place outside and is subject to rising tension and misinformation. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary if a draft bill will be ready later this year, then can't we run this second public consultation concurrently with the stage one process to give us a fighting chance of delivering reform in this parliament? Shelley Ann Somerville. Uh, no, I, I don't think those uh, aspects can be, be done uh, concurrently at all. I, I wouldn't think that is um, advisable. Can, can I say uh, again, if I, if I didn't say it um, expressly clearly enough to Patrick Harvey's uh, um, uh, question, it is our commitment to, to bring forward a bill in this Parliament. That is what I want to do. But I do believe it's absolutely imperative that we have that wider consultation about a draft bill first. Um, I don't believe that the, what happens within a stage one process, important though that is, it would have allowed the type and length of con uh, consultation that we will get through a, a draft bill. It is possible for us to do this draft bill um, and then present a bill to Parliament uh, later on. Uh, that is possible within the timetable, uh, but we will uh, make sure that we have the consultation process and ensure that we, we analyse the responses from that uh, and we'll update Parliament in due course. John McAlpine, followed by Jamie Green. Thank you. I welcome the commitment to a full equality impact assessment, uh, the replacement of the school's guidance and the review of the statistics. And I hope that will include crime statistics. And I'd like to pay tribute to the independent women's campaign, campaign groups who have lobbied for this. Uh, these campaign groups totally respect the right of transgender people to live as however they wish. But this proposal is about changing sex. And it means that any man can still change uh, his sex to female without a medical diagnosis or any gatekeeping at a time when many more people are identifying as the opposite sex without making physical changes. The Cabinet Secretary didn't mention the fact that the GRA confers extensive rights to privacy, uh, which make the single sex exemptions in the Equality Act hard to enforce. So can the Cabinet Secretary tell us if she thinks men with a history of violence against women should be allowed to change their legal sex and conceal their past identity? Uh, I welcome her comments on the single sex rights of the Equality Act 2010 and they're absolutely cor correct. But the Scottish Trans Alliance lobbied to get rid of these and has been telling people now that they don't exist and that trans people can access okay. single sex services. So, yes, in, please, very, in conclusion, could, uh, could she perhaps issue guidance? Uh, because the single sex uh, exemptions are not being enforced. So, could she issue guidance on that and perhaps re review how the Equality Act's single sex exemptions are working across Scotland? Thank you. Shirley Ann Summer. Well, on the final point, I would say and reiterate once again that this government has absolutely no intention to make any changes to uh, or request that the UK government makes any changes to the Equality Act 2010 or to the exemptions that are in place. I think it is very important that I stress once again the point I made in my statement that gender recognition has been in place since 2005. It was in place because a bill was passed by the UK Parliament because of uh, the necessity to ensure that we have uh, a legal provision to allow people uh, to change uh, their gender. And this has been in place, as I say, since 2005. This is not new. What we are debating here is the reform of that process. Uh, can I also point out um, and hopefully uh, reassure on, on one particular aspect that Joan McAlpine mentioned uh, that uh, you cannot take advantage of current privacy protections in the Gender Recognition Act to hide a criminal offence. So individuals can obtain disclosure to certificates for employment purposes. Previous names must be provided as part of that process. 
If a trans person is applying for a disclosure, they can apply using their present name and gender. However, they have to uh, also give previous names and these must be sent to Disclosure Scotland. It is a criminal offence to make a false statement in relation to an application for a disclosure certificate. Jamie Green, followed by Richard Lyon. Uh, thanks, President, Presiding Officer. We, we, we've been asked uh, by many, do we support trans rights or women's rights? And can I just say, I think we can do both. And I think it's the right and proper thing that every one of us in this chamber does both. Today's statement, I think, will come as a disappointment to some, but also offer some comfort to others, perhaps in equal measures. Can I ask a very specific issue that hasn't been raised yet around the guidance in schools? It wasn't clear to me from the statement what exactly is wrong with the current LGBTU Scotland guidance that's given. Why is, why is the Minister replacing it and what will it be replaced with? Shalane Somerville. Well, it, it goes back to one of the areas that I raised in my statement in general about the fact that uh, people have to have a trust and transparency around policies and how they've been developed. Now, as I said in my statement, LGBT youth went out to wide consultation on this issue. It, the, the, the guidance was uh, delivered um, in good faith and with an absolute clear intention to help those in the trans community uh, and uh, those who identify as non-binary. However, there have been concerns raised about it. And my fear is that it, with the level of concern that there was, people were losing faith in that guidance and therefore it's perhaps not being used or it's being called into question. And that's why it's important that the Scottish Government looks at the guidance around policy and implementation so people can have faith in the policy and how it's been decided. And I hope, my, my hope from this work that we can do within government and within our public agencies is then people can have trust in the policy at the end of the day and that will reassure women and it will also reassure those in the trans community that we take the, 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 the issues that they're bringing to this government in terms of bullying, mental health issues and so on exceptionally seriously. And we want to see policies in place that can work for both. But I absolutely um, agree with the member's statement that we can do both. And again, I hope uh, that I can work with him and others within his party to be able to achieve exactly that. Richard Lyle, followed by Kezia Dugby. Thank you, President Officer. There's no doubt that learning about gender recognition has been a journey of discovery for many. What I've realised, though, is that finding out the facts of what reform is proposed and what it will mean for trans people is different to what people may think is proposed. Reading from the Cab Sex speech, I note, the aim of this government is to ensure that trans people in Scotland enjoy equality and feel safe and accept that and accepted for who they are, and I welcome that statement. Can the Cabinet Secretary explain how she can get this over to the public? For I, for one, want it put over to the public. Shirley Ann Summerall. I absolutely agree with what the member says. This is a complex area. It raises emotions, um, and this, um, perhaps many areas, but I think this area in particular, uh, social media is not always the most accurate source of information on this, uh, and that includes just what I'm supposedly saying today, never mind actually on the, the, the wider areas that, around it. That's why I did try to set out in my statement the direction of travel, but I have of, also published a short fact sheet on the proposals that I've outlined today in my statement. And in addition, when we publish the consultation on the draft bill, we'll also publish more detailed uh, fact sheets. I will consider what more can be done to provide straightforward, accurate information that may allay concerns in some areas. And again, I would welcome uh, ideas from members about how we can best provide that accurate and factual information, which I think is absolutely a responsibility of me. It's a responsibility of this government. But I think it's a responsibility, as I said at the end of my statement, for everybody in this chamber to be able to carry out this, uh, this uh, conversation uh, with, with, with dignity and with a respect uh, that people should have for uh, differing opinions on this issue. Kezia Dugdale, followed by Gail Ross. In the last few months, my trans constituents have had their very existence questioned. They have faced hateful rhetoric and have been told that they are psychologically unwell. All they want is to have a birth certificate that reflects who they are. They are not ill, but this sustained deliberation over their right to exist is damaging for their mental health and their well-being. 
So what additional support can the government offer the trans community now that we've put the public spotlight on them? Shirley Ann Somerville. Well, I absolutely uh, agree with uh, the sentiment behind Kezia Dugdale's uh, question. All they want is a birth certificate that reflects who they are. I absolutely um, uh, agree with, with that statement. And that's why, as I said during my statement, I do want to pass this uh, reform uh, to, uh, to recognise the importance that those in the trans community uh, place on this. Uh, I understand uh, and I'm acutely aware that this debate has been toxic um, and I am also acutely aware therefore of the impact that that's having on, on people including those in the trans community uh, who I've spoken to on a number of occasions. I hope that as we move forward with the draft bill and we begin to debate the details of the proposals rather than the speculation uh, that we will be able to, to move that debate into a different space. Uh, but I absolutely, as I said in my statement, will continue to meet and discuss these proposals with equality groups, uh, not just about the bill, uh, but also about the needs of the trans community in general um, as we move forward to support them, which, uh, in which I do absolutely appreciate and understand it um, has been a very difficult time for many of them. Gail Ross, followed by Oliver Mundell. Thank you, President Officer, and I'd also like to thank the Cabinet Secretary for her very measured statement. I've been particularly concerned about the damage the current debate could cause to young trans people who may already feel isolated and stigmatised. What can she do to reassure them and expand on her comments on what she will consult on in terms of support for young people? Shirley Ann Somerville. Well, this, this does lead on uh, very well from the discussion uh, that Kezia Dugdale and I have just had on the impact that it has having on the trans community. And I do very much agree that we need to support young trans people. I've met with uh, a number of individuals uh, since I uh, was honoured to take up this post. Uh, and I've heard directly from them about their concerns about the current system around gender recognition and also the impact that that debate is having, as I said to Kezia Dugdale. And I'm absolutely committed to ensuring that young trans people should receive the help and support uh, that they need. I do intend, obviously, before this consultation issues, to meet again uh, with the trans community and to hear from their concerns um, directly. And um, I would, of course, uh, be very interested to hear uh, from Gail Ross and other members if there are perhaps other suggestions that we need to look at. Again, not just about <coughs> the legal gender recognition, important though that is, but around mm. health, around uh, mental health and well-being to ensure that the trans uh, community um, are assisted when there are areas where they perhaps still see that there is inequality and disadvantage for them. Oliver Mundell, followed by Rona Mackay. Thank you, President Officer. I have strong support for the position and the tone um, that the Cabinet Secretary set out, but does she agree uh, that other people uh, have a legitimate right to reach a different conclusion? Shirley Ann Somerville. I, I think for this, if, um, more than any other statement, presiding officer, I am aware that there will be many people that might not be happy with what I'm proposing, either because um, I'm not going fast enough in proposals or either because they don't want us to do anything. And to be quite frank, I also, we also have to recognise uh, there is a degree of transphobia that is in this country that we must uh, take on at um, every instance. But I am absolutely open to the fact that people have different ideas on, on this. I don't think this is an area that we will come to, cons uh, to consensus on easily, uh, but I do think we can. I think this parliament has risen to that challenge in the past. We've had draft bills, for example, over equal marriage that gave us that space. We might not get to the end of this process and have our absolute unanimity around my proposals, but I would like to think that as a chamber, we can unite uh, around the, the concept of everybody in Scotland, whether it's in the trans community, whether it's women or anybody else, has the absolute right to have uh, their rights protected and respected. And that's exactly what I think this parliament uh, was established or re-established to do. Rona Mackay. that a working group will be set up to look at data on sex and gender. I'm also interested that you quote the work of Caroline Criado-Perez and would ask 
how we could use such data for policy making and to promote the rights of women and tackle unconscious bias. Shirley Ann Samarfa. Uh, well, I think this is a very important area. As I said, it's not directly linked uh, to the uh, area of gender recognition, but very important. And if there is anyone that still hasn't read the book Invisible Women in the Chamber, I would highly recommend it as we move to the summer recess. This is an area, however, that I've discussed with women's groups for some time. And the issue around disaggregated data showing men and women separately can help to show where there is discrimination and indicate where further work needs to be done, whether that's within um, health, whether that's in the workplace, uh, whether that's in all aspects and all parts of, of government. But we need the data to be right first. We need accurate information about the roles of women and men in society to be able to provide the information for us to get our policies right. And that's why I think the working group on data will be a very important aspect of our work on sex and gender um, in general. And the last question is to Jenny Mara. Presiding officer, and I thank the minister very sincerely for a very balanced and considered statement this afternoon. And I think the questions today have shown that across this chamber there is a wealth of experience and a real commitment to getting this legislation right. Will the minister consider opening her door to MSPs from all across this chamber on a regular basis throughout this process? so we can sit down together, represent all views, and reach a consensual way forward. Shirley Ann Summer. Well, if indeed this is the last question within this uh, uh, statement, presiding officer, I think that is an, an absolute fitting tone um, to end on. I would uh, be delighted to take up Jenny Mara's offer um, on this issue to be able to work on a cross-party basis. Um, and as she has particular suggestions about the, the way that we can do that, I would um, be delighted uh, to, to speak to her directly about this. As I've said earlier, we are setting out the government's proposals and our direction for travel for this. Uh, the reason that I'm moving forward with a draft bill is because I am keen to build that consensus that Jerry Mara spoke about. Um, as I said, we'd be delighted uh, to take up Jenny Mara's invitation uh, to work exactly on that basis. That concludes questions in the Cabinet Secretary's statement. I did allow a little extra time, but I'm sorry I wasn't able to take John Mason, Elaine Smith and Monica Lennon. And we shall move on to the next item of business.